quite sure who's in trouble. Protecting the town. All right, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Bank City Council meeting. Would you please join us for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, roll call, please. Please note for the record that all council members are present. All right, great. Okay, I know that we have uh, some some changes in the agenda. So, uh, Clark, you had one that you wanted to uh, make a change. Um, on a consent calendar, Mr. Mayor, I wanted to remove item D. Uh, I was going to discuss that with the city manager and the uh, fire chief. Okay. And uh, then also... Uh, Item G, but item G, uh, I uh, wanted to move on that, but but just remove this one completely from the agenda, uh -oh. item D. Okay, and then Laura, you had a... Um, yes, so um, under Mayor and Council Matters, item B, uh, discussion on whether to create an ad hoc committee concerning a letter to the FAA. Um, I know there are a number of people here to talk about that, so um, I think it might be good to move that up uh, closer to the top of the agenda. Okay. Uh, where where are you? Um, perhaps um, after oral communications. That sounds like a good place. After presentations. Uh, after uh, the oral communications. And before oral presentations. Before presentations. Okay. Is yeah. it is it possible to just make sure we're very conscious of the time? I just I know a lot of times our meetings kind of get away from us in sure. the beginning, so maybe we should put. A certain time yeah actually like acknowledge like a certain time that we want to put toward that since we're moving it all the way up in front of everything else I think it under after I think uh, between presentations and the consent calendar would be fine because I know there's also people here yeah, I think from the library okay okay that'll work everyone and with, with those changes I move adoption of the agenda as you know, there is I, I do have a, a oh, you change do? but uh, are there are any changes from House Member no. Davis or O'Connell. Okay. Um, you know, I'd like to move up uh, the item number A under presentations, uh, the Brisbane Police Department Life Saving Award, to um, above oral communications number one. Okay. I agree. Move adoption as amended. No second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Chief Macias? Good evening, Honorable Mayor and Council Members. Thank you so much for making those modifications um, th for this evening. And thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, at tonight's meeting to present this life-saving award. I'd like to share a little bit about our award achievement program. This program was implemented by my predecessor, retired Chief Tom Hitchcock, several years ago. <clears throat> the purpose of this program is to recognize and commend the actions of police personnel for acts which deserve recognition. The Brisbane Police Department expects a high level of professional conduct from all employees, but there are times when members of this department frequently perform their duties in a manner exceeding the highest standard, and it's through the program that allows us to reward, recognize, and publicly acknowledge those individuals. The program has four different award categories, Medal of Valor, Medal, Medal of Meritorious Conduct, Life Saving Medal, and the Purple Heart Medal. A little bit about the circumstances that led this officer to be recognized this evening. On July 29th at 2.11 p.m., the fire department was dispatched to a medical call at 425 Valley Drive. It was a report of a male subject choking. It is the Brisbane Police Department's policy to always dispatch an officer with the fire personnel. On this date, Officer Giovanni Perez was dispatched to respond with the fire department. Officer Perez arrived on scene as fire arrived. While the fire personnel gathered their medical equipment, Officer Perez was able to run in and locate the victim. Officer Perez noticed that the victim was still choking and unable to breathe. He immediately took action and began performing the Heimlich maneuver. He performed the Heimlich maneuver a second time, this time causing the item that was blocking the subject's airway to dislodge, thus allowing the subject to breathe on his own. Officer Perez saved this gentleman's life by acting quickly, 
not wasting any time in rendering aid to the subject. After clearing the call, Officer Perez drove back to the police department where I encountered him in the hallway. He had a big smile on his face. I asked him why the big smile and he commented, I just saved someone's life, as he walked past me and proceeded to walk out to his patrol car. I followed him out to the parking lot and asked him, wait, tell me what happened. He responded, it's not a big deal, Chief. I was just doing my job. He then got into his car and drove off. A few days later, South San Francisco Battalion Chief called me to make sure I was aware of Officer Perez's life-saving actions and shared with me how impressed his fire personnel were with Officer Perez's quick and immediate response that saved this man's life. In my 26 years of service here, we have had three officers that have received medals of, of, of honor. Officer Robert Guadican received the Purple Heart Award, and retired Sergeant Katherine Jackson and Commander Bob Meisner have received the Life Saving Award. This evening, I have the honor and pleasure of adding Officer Giovanni Perez to the recipient list for the Life Saving Award. This Life Saving Award is merited when a member of the department intervenes directly, resulting in the saving of a life. Congratulations, Officer Giovanni Perez. Please come up to receive your certificate and Medal of Honor. Great job, Gio. Excellent work. <laughs> surprise, surprise. <Yeah. laughs> All right. So now we move on to oral communications. This is an opportunity for anybody uh, in the audience who wants to speak on a matter that's not on tonight's agenda. Uh, I have some slips here. I have one person who um, uh, their subject is the 4-H club. And so, yeah, why don't you come on up, Renee? Hi, my name is Renee Olagi, and I am the community leader, current community leader for the Daly City Commonwealth 4 H Club. Mm -hmm. We are uh, looking for members and feel that Brisbane would be the perfect community to ask to come join us. It's a youth club. If, for those who don't know what 4 H is, it's a youth uh, club run by youth. It's virtually a, a leadership development program mm -hmm. via hands-on projects. So anything can be a project. Um, these kids uh, from 5 to 19 can join. We've had projects like a, when you go to the fair and you see the animals, that's part of 4-H, but actually it's a pretty small part of 4-H. Mm. We have done vocal performing arts, we have dog obedience, dog dance, we've had um, sign language, we have a farm over here on Guadalupe Canyon Road that has no electricity, no running water, so the kids decided to build from scratch a solar system. So they took and built the boxes, soldered the solar cells, and put in a solar system so that at least we had lights in the barn. Because when the daylight savings time comes, it's you're working by flashlight trying to take care of <coughs> if you have animals. Sure. Um, so I'm here to introduce people to Daily City 4-H. Um, we are in a transition flex right now. We're looking for a permanent spot to meet. We are also, most of my kids have aged out. So I, I really only have two members as a present, mm. so we need to get at least five. Um, or else that land that we have on Guadalupe County Road we lose our charter, it goes away, and it never comes back. Um, so I just wanted to kind of put the word out there that we are a club. We are looking for members, 5 to 19. Uh, there are opportunities for kids to do projects at the club level, the county level. There's leadership opportunities for kids at the club level, county level, state level, national level. There's uh, international exchange opportunities. Uh, I ran into a girl yesterday who um, I hadn't seen in about 10 years. And, and sh I was asking what she's doing and how her sister's doing. She's telling me about her job and she's saying it's a lot of public speaking and she's saying it's 4-H. This is why I got this job, it's 4-H. And she tells me about her sister. She says, it's 4-H. Nobody kid really likes public speak a lot, but these kids learn from age five. I've had a five-year-old at a county event. It's called Presentation Day. Teach 
kids how to draw a bee. That's all we want them to do is to get up and be able to be comfortable speaking to adults and youth, teaching adults and youth. We have kids that become team leaders and teach um, projects. And um, I'm, not that, I'm not as good at public speaking as my kids are. <laughs> but um, that's what I came for. I just came to let people know that we are around, we are available, and we believe that Brisbane would be perfect community to join for our club. Yeah, no, I totally agree. Uh, do you, any questions from the, okay. Uh, I have Addison. a question. So um, I actually really wanted to be in 4-H when I was a kid, but I don't think we realized that there was a facility, you know, so close. There's a program so close to Brisbane. Uh, have you contacted the Brisbane School District and asked if you could put a flyer in our Thursday folder? I have not yet. I, uh, okay. I was community leader. I left for a little bit, and now I'm back as a uh, community leader again. Uh, the club's small, so we're, like I said, we're trying to regroup, but we had a lot of kids graduate out. Um, and we've been struggling for a couple of years trying to bring in Delhi City, and Delhi City is so spread out and widespread. It's been a difficult for me. I'm, I live in Pacifica. I ran Pacifica Club, and I went from 30 kids to 140 kids wow. two years. And to me, that was easy. They always say it's been a struggle, sure. so, to say the least. And I believe that Brisbane is a perfect community to grow that club. That would be a great way to get the word out straight to parents because those are the people who really need to know. So if you yeah. contact the secretaries at, at the school district, I'm sure that they would. Oh, yeah, I would put out flyers. Yeah, right now yeah. we're kind of in a flex because we don't have a meeting space. We used to use Take Lea Center in Delhi City, and then they wanted to charge us $75 a month, and we're a tiny little club. We don't have that kind of money. So we're in the process of looking. I don't want to put out a flyer until I have a meeting space. So we're, if anybody has ideas, I'm um, open ears. Well, well actually, yeah. Mr. Mayor, I got, I got a suggestion. Is huh. um, Because it is an after-school program, and perhaps uh, uh, could give you the contact information of uh, Stuart Schillinger, who happens to be sitting there, and he's in charge of the recreation program. Okay. They all work for him. And, you know, perhaps you can email Stuart and then uh, he can give you some direction of who to contact with the city and, and perhaps, you know, his staff can get together with, with you and maybe... We're club and we're, we usually meet in the evenings because parents have to take the kids or on weekends. Um, it's run by youth. They, they have a board. They have an executive board. They do a budget. They learn how to run ex their executive board of meetings and club meetings. So the club meetings meet once a month and each project meets on average once a month, so the kids can sign up for as many or as few. If we don't have a project and another club has it, the parents are willing to drive them and that other club has that particular project, like dog obedience, um, they're able to join that project if they have them. So we're not limited to just the projects that are offered in our club. Mm. Yeah. So I will do that. Yeah, and do you have um, some contact info, Renee? I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I read lips. I didn't know who oh, was sorry. talking uh, Do you have contact? information like a business card i did uh, i have a bunch here and i gave some to ingrid to okay get. great i, I have a whole bunch here all right i'm sure i'll get a card from ingrid and i'll, I'll send you an email yes please. um yeah i, I can you connect should. you with someone in the school district kind of late in the year we start our year usually starts in july most some of the clubs start in september october we would like to start early before school starts just to start meeting and get things rolling otherwise everything feels because there's so many things that we have going on, it feels pressured. But this year we're starting a little late. That's okay. But I think what you're you're trying to do is fantastic, and I think uh, a lot of our youth in Brisbane would really uh, yeah, appreciate it, it, this opportunity. Yeah, yeah. and I and you'll get some stuff. There's some samples of projects we've had in the past. Okay. Yeah. Just give it to Ingrid, and yep. and we'll okay. get it. And Ingrid. thank you. All right. Thank, thank you, you, Renee. Okay. So. We will move on to uh, other presentations. So item B under presentations is uh, the government outreach request application. Yes, sir. Let's be me. Okay. I will take that one on. So thank you, Mayor, Council members. Good evening. I wanted to talk to you about government outreach. I think there's a flyer that's been passed around to, to most of the folks in the room. It's on the dais. There's also one on the outside. and. The specific reason I wanted to bring this to your attention is this is a online, it's, it's a web phone based service application that we've been using for a couple of years now. It actually came about back 
as a result of the recession in the last decade when we went down by a significant number uh, of the amount of staff people that we had. And so in an effort to still provide good service to the citizens, we went to a smartphone-based app. And I, and I guess, you know, you call it a smartphone or call it the magical computer that resides in your pocket. I dare, I dare say that as we look across the room, I've probably got a high 90% plus of people that have one of these in their pocket right now. And, and to just give you an example of how I think how ubiquitous these are and how well used they are, last year in the state of California, there were 25,000 911 calls made. 20,000 of them came in over one of these. Uh, I think everyone in the room is probably aware that if this meeting starts going badly for me, I could pull up Uber, Lyft, Yellow Cab Taxi app, and probably have a car out front in five minutes. Or if, on the other hand, things are going well and I get hungry, I could pull up the Pizza Hut app and have a pepperoni pizza delivered here to my desk. So the challenge that we are trying to do is to get people to use this online service request in the exact same way, to understand that it's part of their life. And it's not just because... It helps the Public Works Department. Really what it helps is you. It helps the citizen at large because when you use this application, the information, the location of, of the service that you're requesting, the actual problem itself, and your contact information goes directly to the person who's going to order or perform that service. And so that if we have a question, we can get back to you. And people go, whoa, geez, how often does that happen? It happens all the time. Just last week, we received a call. Police and Public Works were both dispatched to report of a hazard in the roadway. Lagoon Way and Sierra Point Parkway, there's a traffic sign that had been knocked down. Go out to Lagoon Way, Sierra Point Parkway, nothing. Road was clear. So where do you start searching from then? So then we, we expand our search. We're a mile away from it, and we find out that it's actually at the northbound US 101 ramp, Sierra Point Parkway, vicinity, Shoreline Court. And so that, that would have helped us if we had been able to call the person back. We also get the same thing all the time. Probably the most common one we get is, is streetlights. And, and I street lights and potholes, and I completely understand from a consumer's perspective how they get this, because if that lights off every time you go home, or if you drive over that pothole every morning, you want to call in and say, "Fix that damn pothole! It's right there on Yadia Street," and then hang up. But that doesn't really get us the information we need. That doesn't give us the location. That really doesn't give us the problem in many cases. So we oftentimes need to contact people back. So I'm going to bring the application up online. I actually have it in this particular case. I think it helps a little bit for visibility. How are we doing there, Ingrid? Can we, can we give me a boot? There we go. So if you go to either your Apple store or you go to the Android store and you download the, the government online request, and for those of you who are from out of town, don't stop listening because if you download it on your phone here in Brisbane and you're in another city that uses it and you've got your GPS services on, it'll recognize it. It'll recognize where you were. It's really a lovely thing to do. So it's this easy to use. I, I've already entered requests in here before because oftentimes <coughs> that's how I communicate with my staff after I downloaded. So I click on new issue, and it says, yes, Randy, we know you have issues. Which particular issue is it that you want to talk to us about today? And you'll note down in the lower, you see those little crosshairs there? It's figuring out where I'm at. It knows that I'm here in City Hall because obviously I've got my GPS turned on. So I'm just going to pick one that I like. Let's just look. This is the whole list of items that you can select from. These are the types of things that are wrong. And the reason we use these is this vectors us to the right person. So each of these different categories that are in there, it, some of them go to the same staff member, but they all go to the right member. So we have utility teams out there. We have buildings and grounds teams out there. This takes it to the right person who's going to sign it. So I'm going to say I, I, it's a street sign problem. I'm going to add a comment. And I'm going to let it select. There we go. Now it likes me. Please fix this darn light because it's driving me crazy, right? This, this is not an uncommon request from us. <laughs> so I go back, and I've asked them to do that. If I wanted to, if I was standing near the light and I wanted to take a picture of the pole, I could click Add Photo. I say Take Photo or Video. In this particular case, I'm taking a photo of the Charming Mitch Bull. Thank you for community <laughs> development. Let's cancel that, though, because Mitch is not broken. There's nothing wrong with Mitch at all. Uh, but the other thing it allows you to do is you can also use this. You can move the map around. So if your GPS is not spot on, and you see it's telling me there, I'm manually selecting it, I can move it and say, no, 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 it's actually this one right here. I know I'm in the council chambers, but the light was out when I came in. So I can put it right there, and then all I have to do is in the upper right, I hit submit, and I'm done. 
you get a response back. You get an automatically generated response. It, it gives you an, an, a preset date of we think it's going to take this many dates to get back to you. When we finish it, we send a response back to you and say thank you for submitting it. It's done. And if you've got any questions because you get a response, you can, uh, you can ping that right back and say, hey, I sent this in two weeks ago and it's still not fixed. What's going on? And you actually get answered by a person. So I like this program. I really encourage you to use it. I really do think it helps us get the best service out to the citizens. So that's government outreach, and I was not paid for this promotional uh, advertisement. Yeah. Happy to take questions. Yeah, you know, I want to thank you, Randy, for doing the presentation. You know, I apologize for not remembering that I had asked you to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> when I saw it on the agenda here, I was like, okay, government well, outreach, the best application. And, and we didn't have this until uh, we got to the dais. So, um, yeah, I, I had a constituent who called and said, hey, we got a light out and, you know, by my house. Can you do something about it? And so I gave the information to Randy, and Randy said, hey, could you have them do this? And, and then we started talking about it and said, hey, you know, this is a great uh, service that we should share with the community. I mean, it's been available for a long time, but we just haven't had a presentation, at least I, maybe it's been a while before the council. I don't know if we've ever... Definitely been a while, sir. We always think that we're the most important department, but <laughs> it, apparently people aren't just buying into that yet. Yeah, so, I mean, and this is excellent. So, um, but of course, I think we're going to need to uh, publicize it more than just tonight, you know, at other events so that, um, you know, like maybe a community in the park or whatever. Yes, and, and I'd be remiss, it. Caroline Chung would be mad at me if I didn't announce to you that it's going to be on the cover page of the November Star. Okay. Perfect. So we're using that Perfect. to get it out as well. Okay, nice. great. It's in the Star also. Outstanding. Good, right. We do put the ads in there periodically, right? And it's going to be in there again, so very good. Okay. Thank you very much, Randy. Any, any questions for Randy? Okay. Uh, you, you had a question, Tony? Actually, the police officers are power users for inputting it. Yeah. I just put it on mine, and I sent you one. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will be certain that one is attended to. Get it? <laughs> Good job, Clark. <laughs> All right. So uh, moving on, we have a uh, presentation uh, from our library staff, our annual report. Um, Francisco. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, good evening, Mayor Lenz and members of the City Council. I'm pleased to present the Library Annual Report for fiscal year 15 and 16. Um, just a little background on our library system for members in the audience and everyone. Uh, the San Mateo County Free Library uh, was established in 1912. In 1913, a levy was approved, and the majority of our funding comes from property tax still today. Approximately uh, 280,000 people live within the boundaries of the uh, library legal taxing district. Today, our 12 libraries and one bookmobile and the e-library, which is open 24-7, provide services to 11 cities and un unincorporated areas of the county uh, as part of the Joint Powers Authority. By the way, all the pictures on this PowerPoint are real pictures. Nothing is stock, or so they're from our libraries and our programs. So I think it's it's wonderful. <clears throat> this is our new vision, uh, which is one of the most significant activities completed this year, was the development of a and approval of a new strategic plan. And here's our new three goals, uh, which are high-level strategic goals. We developed to describe the priorities of the organization and what we hope to accomplish. And I won't read them just because everybody has them. Oh, by the way, also, um, I just gave City Clerk Ingrid um, a packet for each one of you, which has um, a letter from our library director who's in the audience and also a uh, printed, fresh off the um, print, uh, it's a, the annual report, which more information as well. Uh, so you, you will see that in your inbox later tonight. Uh, <clears throat> Oop. I think. Oh, so 
sorry, I skipped a few, a, week, <coughs> a few slides. Uh, compared to the public libraries in the nation, uh, San Mateo County is a high-performing organization. Uh, we have been ranked a four-star library the, for the eighth consecutive year by Library Journal. We rank 18th nationwide, second in California. Um, yeah, first is Santa Monica. And we wish, yeah. <laughs> um, and here is why we do so well. We, um, the, the chart shows that we do really well in our circulation. And uh, the trends are really going down for most libraries in the United States. Circulation is going down. Um, uh, in fiscal year, the library circulated this fiscal year 3.3 million items um, with 2.2 million visits for all of our 12 libraries. Locally, Brisbane circulated um, 63,950 items and there were 50,000 visits to the library. Um, the holds and the reserves, we had 9,000 this year and people checking out their own materials was 27,000. So, and there's a lot of data we can give you if you guys are more interested in digging down. <clears throat> Open for access, uh, championing technology and closing the digital divide has been a significant effort uh, for the library. Uh, some of our most popular program is the Wi-Fi hotspots, which we circulated 13,000 of them this year. Uh, E-library visits is 4,400, and we've also done um, over 206,000 public computer hours and one million and a half of wireless connections. Uh, we have digital collections, laptop anytime, vending machines. We have a program here at Brisbane called Mouse Squad, which teaches STEM uh, activities for youth. Um, we have portable chargers. We have bike locks. We circulate a lot of things that are not just books. <clears throat> Open for learning, commitment to enriching our communities, supporting family literacy. One of our biggest accomplishments is the summer learning, summer reading, it used to be called, and which addresses early literacy in the home. It helps parents and caregivers improve their the development of, ch of children. Uh, we hosted over 11,000 cultural programs with an attendance of 300,000 uh, people coming. In Brisbane, we hosted eight, 680 programs um, with an attendance of about 8,000 people coming. Um, this, this year, 57% of the county youth participated in the summer learning program. Um, and here in Brisbane, we had 900 youth signed up for summer. Um, we hired uh, 40 interns in 2015, and this year we hired 200 interns. And they logged in over uh, 7,500 hours working with students. Our library recently was also honored with the um, Urban Libraries Council. Uh, top Innovator Award for the Lena program, which is a program with babies where we're recording all the words that they're saying with a little vest and we're talking to parents and we've been able to just have tremendous change in behavior with parents who don't normally interact with uh, their babies and it's critical with um, early literacy. Open for transformation, <clears throat> creating welcoming and well-equipped facilities. Actually, Brisbane is going to be on focus this year. Um, <clears throat> we, um, we are renovating libraries. We're building new libraries in the county. Uh, we have underway Atherton, Brisbane, East Palo Alto, Half Moon Bay, and Pacifica uh, to try to change them to libraries of the 21st century. And uh, a lot of the, the focus will be on maker spaces and flexible spaces, 3D printing services, and a lot of what a new library could bring us. Something very significant, and I'm wearing part of it, which is my na new name tag. Mm -hmm. And we have several other things that our library staff are wearing, t-shirts, and we've completely rebranded the our, our library, and it's been over a decade since we last did it. Our new logo consists of an imaginative burst of knowledge symbol representing the spread of information, our family of libraries, and excitement that em emanates from learning something new. 
In order to fully capture the idea that we have many locations, but we're all part of one unified vision, we have made the switch from San Mateo County Library, singular, to San Mateo County Libraries, which is what you see up on the screen right now. And here is our corresponding brand tagline, open for exploration, which extends our, the logos, the spirit, by conveying the essence of who we are, our mission, and our vision. I would like to thank the library staff and their tremendous work and creativity, the Friends of the Library for their dedication and advocacy, the city staff and council for our ongoing support, in particular Council Member Liu, uh, City Manager Holstein for their work in the Library Joint Power Authority Governing Board and Operations Committee. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, any questions for Francisco? Oh, good job. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate, you know, uh, uh, the work that you and your staff do at the library. I know uh, two of my most important little constituents use it exclusively or extensively. And uh, hopefully when a couple of years we get a new library on board, it's really going to be a place where kids gather. I mean, they do right now, but even more so, really enhance that and look forward to seeing that. So. Thank you. Yes, me too. Yes, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Francisco. Very nice to see you. And um, I've enjoyed working with you and with the whole library staff. And uh, it's exciting to take part and participate in that, that rebranding campaign um, and to see it actually uh, take vision and, you know, c come into play. And I'm looking forward to the new library as well. Thank you, Francisco. Thank you, Mayor. Have a good day. All right. All right, next up, kind of nice segue into uh, our next presentation, which is uh, the new library. I'll take a moment to do an introduction first, sir, so we, we, can, we can all say hi to Susie. So good evening. Uh, there was a brief staff report <coughs> attached to this. The new Brisbane Library is something that we've been hoping and dreaming and planning for many, many years. Even once we get actively engaged in it back in the early part of 2015, it's taken us to this point to where we're ready to finally give the council what, what we count as a 35% a plus or minus presentation on the status of where we are. Uh, you'll, you'll recall from your actions in this, and folks can read in the staff report, that we've had a very, very interested library stakeholder work group that's been working on this and meeting with the architect over many times. We've had a number of public outreach meetings. We had uh, well over three dozen people meet with us when we held that meeting under the community meeting room. I know that the, the mayor and the, the vice mayor were both there and attended that. It was, it was lovely to see you both. We had well over 100 people stop by the booth that we had a day in the park. It's absolutely wonderful. We're at the point where, you know, we've had 5% of the population of Brisbane combined look at this, and I'm not sure that we've had a lot of other projects that have anywhere near that amount of input. So we're really excited. We've gotten an incredible amount of positive feedback. Uh, everyone, of course, wants a new library. It's hard to be against libraries, right? It's, hard. it's like being against apple pie and baseball, even if you're, uh, even if you're a Cleveland Indians fan. Um, <laughs> sorry for that reference for those of you from Cleveland. Um, so, so here we are tonight. Uh, Susie Marzola is going to give us a presentation, about a 15 to 20 minute presentation on how Siegel and Strain got to where they are, the things that they've learned about our community, and how they've implemented that into a plan. As I noted in the staff report, there, there's, there's one issue that may or may not come up. I know outside of this meeting, we've had a conversation about the area that's presently designated as a history and an archival room. That was something that a uh, the previous council, when they were sitting, told staff to put into it, and we're happy to bring that up and happy to have that conversation again, but I, I think I'll defer any comments on that until we let Susie make her comments and get us through this. And so with that, Miss Susie String. Susie String. Marzola. <laughs> yeah. Marzola, and you're so close, but so Larry did not get you to change your name? I'm Larry did not get me to change my name. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor and Council Thank members. You, Randy. It's a real, real <laughs> treat to be here tonight, and it's a huge treat to work with your community. I you want to pick the microphone okay. up a little bit. A little there. taller. Here yeah. we go. A little <laughs> taller. Um, and it's been great to get to know your community. As Randy mentioned, uh, we do a lot of the work we do involves for public work, which we think is buildings are a value statement of a community, and as such, they should reflect that community. And here in Brisbane, we've uh, had the opportunity to meet with a number of residents and incorporate that thinking into a library that Brisbane can envision for itself. We also take a close look at the cultural and the um, 
let's see, does this advance? There it goes. We also take a close look at the physical, cultural, and value context for clues to design solutions that capture the best of your town and embed that in the design of a highly valued uh, public amenity. We visited Brisbane a number of times, um, many different times a day, many different times a week. We've talked to folks, as mentioned, and we've learned a few things. One is that the people who live here love Brisbane, <laughs> and that it's you, the people of Brisbane, that makes this place special. You love the weather, the location, the connected remoteness, and you love your own tight-knit, can-do community of friends and neighbors. We also learned that you are a very passionate and engaged community. Partnership and participation are aspects in all aspects of life, and kids and families are central to that experience. And you're a very active bunch. <clears throat> the park, the coffee shop, the fields, the community center, these are all facilities that are well used and well kept. And a larger library that's more accommodating, that's more comfortable, will be a great community asset and a perfect addition to what you have here now. We've used our time with a stakeholder group um, and the San Mateo County Library folks who are also here this evening to better understand your particular community library needs and to help you design a library that fits into your daily lives. We met with the stakeholder groups a few times as Landy, uh, Randy mentioned and we've conducted one-on-one -on -one and one-on-two informational interviews um, with members of the San Mateo County Library, with members of the staff, um, the city staff, and with the members of the uh, stakeholder group. We also met with the city manager, community development manager, the chief of police and chief of fire, just to make sure that collectively we are seeing the same thing and we are aligning the expectation of the, this library with the expectation of the people who have to take care of it um, and build it. <clears throat> As Randy mentioned, we attended a public information session on um, August 25th that was held in the community room. About three dozen folks showed up to that. And then on September 29th, day in the park, we had about 120 people we calculate show up. And it was a great day. There was a lot of great interest and enthusiasm for the project. We had models, drawings, um, and a display of the building materials that will be used in the library at our booth. And a lot of this is right now outside in the lobby here. <clears throat> All of these um, informed our vision or un informed our understanding of your town, which kind of grew, that, which kind of we, we developed into a, a series of points. The first point being that this is indeed a small town where everyone knows one another, and this compact downtown tucks up against San Bruno Mountain, which provides you with much of your identity. There are um, many here in this town who are looking for a library that fits into your intimate downtown setting that's mostly small buildings on small lots um, with a streetscape of simple and straightforward and modest buildings that are softened with huge mature trees that line the street down, going down visitation. On the other hand, people said they want the library to stand out, and we think this uniqueness can come from a strong collective desire to bring the outside into the library, the daylight, the fresh air, the gardens, the views, in a way that's straightforward, not glitzy, as one person said, and in a way that blurs the edges between indoors and outdoors. As the community's living room, we heard that the new library should have comfortable places um, for people to be either in public or alone in a public space. The library pr uh, program areas should offer a wide variety of places to sit with a book or a magazine or to learn or to work and socialize. Additionally, the spaces should be flexible and open and spacious, large enough to move furniture around and furnishings around for different uses and programs. As a community, you're also very committed to the arts, and we are very excited that this project will be your pilot project for your public arts uh, initiative. <clears throat> and as demonstrated throughout City Hall here, you're committed to telling your story and you 
and you have a treasured history, and the library has been identified as a place to extend that storytelling through display of historical fo um, photographs and other archival information. As a community, you're forward thinking, you care about the environment, and you want to demonstrate it through the use of natural, durable, high recycled content materials that are low VOC, particularly for the interior materials. And you are looking for a design of a library that takes advantage of the climate, that integrates passive design solutions, such as daylighting and natural ventilation, that features highly efficient electrical and mechanical equipment so that you can both reduce your electric and um, energy bill and lower your carbon footprint, and you're interested in collecting rainwater for reuse. All of this information went on to inform the basis for the vision of the new Brisbane Library. There are two big ideas that are central to um, the design concept. One is this notion of carrying the, out, the outdoors into um, the ma main entry space off of visitation and from Monterey into a kind of a secret garden behind that's part of, a, that's, that's an outdoor library room, a courtyard, if you will. And the other big idea driving the library design is the intention of designing a community library that specifically meets the needs of this particular community and the needs of this particular San Mateo County library staff. <clears throat> so you're invited into the front of the building from the street, from the sidewalk, through an entry grove, an entry garden, under a big porch that's right up here at the front of the building. Um, past the book drop and through these huge big entry doors, um, past a collection of selected plants and trees that are either on the San Bruno watch, um, San Bruno Mountain watch lit, plant list or the city of Brisbane street tree list. We're suggesting ginkgos, which are the tree in the middle, for, um, to flank the entry for a couple of reasons. They can be spectacular as they change through the seasons, and they have an ability to grow in pretty cramped quarters, which is what we'll have right there in front of the library. Once you get past this entry patio, you'll go through the front doors into this big, gracious central hall that runs down the middle of the library into the central courtyard behind and then back out through the community room onto Monterey. We've also planned for the possibility of a future connection to the corner lot should that become available and should that be desirable. The central space is light filled. It's a place where you can both, where both function and kind of uplift, come together and wonder, come together under the pop up in the roof. The history is, can be celebrated on the walls through imagery displayed above the bookshelves. <clears throat> the spaces are large and flexible um, because we know that priorities will change over time. And um, we've also designed this to have a place, whoop, to have a place for everybody. There's a quiet reading room, a discovery zone, a place for the teen collection and the children collection, all within one big space. Flipping it around, looking at... Um, the Monterey entrance, uh, we had received a number of specific questions regarding the design of this side of the building at the public information <coughs> meeting. And they had to do with, with how we transition to the neighborhood to the east and transition to the parking area and the Eagles building to the west. So looking for a both and solution, what we did was flip the uh, trash and recycling enclosure to the other side that helps set up a visual block to the Eagles um, parking lot, if you will, and that made the neighbors happy because they were concerned about the enclosure being on this side. Um, the new setback or the new library is set back from the street about 15 feet thus creating this entry, if you will, a pre-function space out in front of the community room on the Monterey side. Um, and it's this space here as well as the community room that will have a great view to the south of the, of the mountain, of San Bruno Mountain. 
In terms of the plan organization, um, we were provided with a list of interior spaces, shown here on the right, of what the spaces that needed to go into the library. Those were part of the space needs assessment, and as Randy mentioned, there was a request to put in a history archive space, which is shown here at about 220 square feet, shown here in the plan. So I'll go through this and explain what each of these spaces are. The way the collections are organized, there's the uh, discovery and marketplace have the collections for uh, mostly adults. There's a teen and tween collection space right here in the middle. The children are back here at the end, so you kind of go from oldest to youngest through there. There's a grand, there's the grand marketplace and entry hall here in the middle. There's usually someone right here or in here to greet you, a librarian. And these folks do know everybody in your community, it seems. For those who don't want the buzz of the library can come into a quiet room that's here and pull a glass door closed behind them. Here's the staff workroom. The restrooms, a covered walkway that takes you out to the community room that can be opened or closed off from um, the maker space, and a, a very generous hidden garden, secret garden, that we think of it as an outdoor room for the library at this location. Here is this pre-function space out here on Monterey, and the big grove, entry grove and patio up here on um, visitation. You get views of San Bruno Mountain from this corner up here on visitation, as well from over here and then through this community room and the glass doors and windows on either side. The, oh, I should say briefly, this is the historic archive room. Should this room be replaced or should this room not need to be an archive storage room, the library has expressed great interest in converting it to two smaller study spaces that have, um, that have the possibility of being checked out and used by students and a tutor, for example, or a small, another quiet room that can take uh, s students studying in groups into a location where they won't disrupt their hard-working neighbors next to them in the library. Uh, just to compare this library to what you currently have, the current library, the existing or proposed library is 7,460, 7, yeah, about 7,500 square feet. Your existing library, shown here in red, is approximately 2,720 square feet. So we're looking at um, 2.75 times more space inside, plus a, a courtyard that the library themselves can control. So just a quick um, walkthrough of the library space, a day in the life, if you will. So in the morning, what happens is often um, moms and their kids arrive early, even before the library opens for story time, and that might happen in this space here in the children's library, or back here in the children's garden, or perhaps even in the community room up here. Other folks who are using the library at that time are mostly adults and older folks in town who might come in to browse the new fiction, to grab a magazine or a newspaper, or to do some research. Um, stroller parking, we've learned, is a great big deal, so that's what you see out here. There's plenty of spaces to park strollers and uh, space in here for that story time that might happen in this area or this area, depending on the size of the group. <coughs> Between 11 and 2, the kids have gone home, the youngest kids have gone home, and then the light, that's kind of the quiet time of the library, where mostly adults are there working or researching or using the printer. A lot of boarding passes are printed at between the hours of 11 and 2, apparently. Um, and then about 2 o'clock, the students start coming in during the week. Um, they've picked up a snack down the street at the store. They either ride their bike and they park them on the street. Um, up here or they come in with their skateboard and there's a place to park them right there. They have their snack in the courtyard. They might file into the um, they might file into either the makerspace or the community room for an uh, after school program and then slowly they'll work their way back into the library. At this point 
sitting anywhere they need. If the study rooms are available, they might use those. The quiet space might have tables available. Um, and then towards the end of the day, they either ride or walk or skate home, or they wait outside on the patio at the bench or the seat wall for their, their ride home. And that's kind of how um, we've come to understand and see how your library works. The, the supervision is right here at the information counter, not in very close to the teen area, but not so much for supervision, but because the librarians are very helpful to the students who use this. They have the pencil, they have the marker, they have the scissors, they help find a book. And um, that your librarians speak very highly of the students who use this library, very comfortable being around adults, there to learn, there to make the best use of their time. And that's always great to hear. So the community room in the back um, can be broken into either two spaces, or it can be used as an open space, as one big space, shown in two uh, configurations here. And the library can be blocked off after hours so that this whole area can be used after hours with access in from Monterey. So there's access to the restrooms, access to the courtyard, mm -hmm. access to the enclosed area for the, um, of the children's garden. The interiors, we'll dig into the interiors for a moment, our associated architect Karen Payson has used the same kind of guiding principles that we've used for the building um, to help uh, consider the uh, interiors finishings and furnishings. So the, um, the finishes were selected to enforce the indoor-outdoor experience and connect to nature which many we talked to identified with, the mountain, the mission blue, the native flora, all of which is integral to the city's character as this tucked away peaceful spot in a larger crowded metropolitan area. The proposed finishes are wood, were practical, wood, felt, and durable natural fabrics, and otherwise they're reflected to, uh, they're selected to reflect nature. The carpet is a dappled, it kind of <coughs> darkens a dappled light on a forest floor. Um, and the porcelain tile shown here has a certain grain to it that also reflects nature. Most of the colors are muted, as you can see, and others are saturated um, hues that are used for punch and fun. The, furniture, the furnishings themselves are also a mix of practical and playful. Starting at the front of the library, there's comfortable seating and low tables and uh, these very high quality wooden top tables and lightweight bent plywood chairs around the tables in both of these areas. As you move into the teen area, it gets more playful and colorful. There might be a uh, tucked in uh, space to sit here, movable chairs in this area, um, a place in a bookshelf to, to perch right here. And we're also proposing some felt streamers between this zone and the children's zone to help mute the sound a little bit between those service areas. Moving further back um, into the children's collection, things get even more colorful in a little wild. There is a collection of Ottomans that are proposed to, that younger kids can move around. There are small uh, children-sized tables and chairs. There's an interactive play area that might end up on this wall for uh, pre-literacy activities. And then these big um, penguin chairs that a child, a toddler, can cozy up with a parent in a book. The entry, um, the, the marketplace area, the entry hall right here in the middle has, connects both to the outside at the entry and the courtyard. And the idea of this is to bring that sense of the outside in. And that is enforced with the collection of movable gondolas but for the book collection or the um, market, or, excuse me, the, the new fiction and popular book area and then cafe-like tables that are in this zone. 
And the outdoor furniture is just a transi it's a smooth transition, some very comfortable recreation seating back here in the courtyard, uh, table, lightweight table, metal tables and chairs that can be moved around, wood benches in the front uh, patio. Um, all selected to complement a built-in wooden bench that's also in the courtyard. <laughs> Here's a view of that rear, an updated view of that courtyard. The children's play space is enclosed so that when these doors are open, the youngsters won't get too far afield. They can stay within a kind of contained area on beautiful days when those can open wide. <clears throat> the natural play area is imagined with um, a collection of native plants and boulders for kids to sit on or hop around on. And we're also en envisioning a little casita or a playhouse, if you will, up in this corner that's either a natural inspired bent um, willow or something constructive of smaller logs. <clears throat> and if council member <laughs> Lori gets, um, if, we, if we have our way, we'll even have a beautiful planted wall that can be seen from the community room or perhaps one that can be seen at the end of the circulation space outside the children's room and along the back wall. And this is both budget and maintenance um, driven, but it would be great to really focus that in as this lush garden space. And of course, there's a cistern, a 5,000 gallon cistern. We're aiming to have one that's about 10 feet in diameter, but only six feet tall, so it doesn't loom over the children's space in the back. And they, this is just one of many sustainable design features. We are intending to have operable windows along these clear stories. The building will be shaded with um, trees and screens on the west and south side. And we hope to be photovoltaic ready along the center spine of the roof. If, um, our goal is to provide you with a building that will achieve net zero in the future. And those are just some of the few goals we look to incorporate sustainable goals into every move we make and sustainable strategies into every move we have made. So they're everywhere. They're in passive design, they're in um, zero energy, they're in water design, they're in the material selection. So that's all part of what we're doing now and we hope to exceed the minimum requirement of lead silver um, equivalents. We look at what the sun is doing across the site so we understand how to control glare and, and heat gain. Um, we also look at it where the hot spots are and the sunny spots are so that we know where to shade areas. We look at daylighting so that we can incorporate good strategies for getting as much natural and usable light in there. These two studies show uh, we modeled the building first with some clear stories. This is a daylight study and discovered we did not get enough ample daylight in here. So we changed that out to a skylight scheme and saw that that way we could get uh, levels of daylight that were enough to actually read a book. Um, <coughs> Here's the section of the building, uh, the, especially in the middle where we need a little more electric light. We're proposing these large drums of light that can then be augmented by linear fixtures that would fill in the lighting gaps. And you can see on the walls here the history display along the back and the interactive play area and the water tank. Um, the other thing we learned was by by kicking up the roof on either side, which helps us with our water collection, we also are helping with the acoustical separation, which was the number one complaint we heard from people about your existing library. So by kicking this up, the, light, the sound that's created in this space is kicked away from its adjacent space. And the children's zone, which is actually the no noisiest zone in the library, especially during story time and times where kids are there, um, the noise is kicked out and away from the teen and most importantly, uh, the kind of discovery area. Here's a section uh, through the community room where the same lighting and acoustical ideas are carried in. Just for information, this build, the this building edge, the tallest part, which is about 19 feet for this portion of the building, is 15 feet away from uh, the 
property line which conforms to the residential zone and um, the tallest part of the main library is well within the height limit for the commercial zone that this library sits in. We also look at the wind. We've heard that wind is a problem here. We've experienced wind can make a pleasant situation uncomfortable. Um, and we learn by looking at the wind rose, big surprise, the wind comes from the west. We all knew that. Um, we also learned that it can get into pretty high gusts. So we studied what the wind, how the wind would play in the courtyard. And during the worst case scenario, strong wind, we do get a little bit of um, dis high wind, about 18 miles per hour wind in here, which the trees located at this location will really help dissipate. Actually, trees do a lot to help dissipate wind. And we looked at it in a more typical condition. And the courtyard, even with a um, a 15 mile per hour wind out in front, you'll actually have a very pleasant experience back here in the courtyard. And then um, this is this was the original sketch of the front. This was a fun thing we did a couple of few weeks ago <laughs> with the um, stakeholders group. This was our original rendering of the front of the building. <laughs> and then um, we had heard from people reviewing the design, stakeholders, that this idea of these playful tree columns that marched down the middle of the building were too, inside the building, they were a little too cluttered. They cluttered the space. We heard that from Council Member Davis. So we said, all right, let's get rid of them. And so we took them out. It's like, ooh, that's a little too aggressive. <laughs> um, why don't we put in a pair of slender columns at the corners of the porch. Well, that just feels timid. Okay, well, let's beef it up a little bit. Nah, that's not quite feeling right. What about the tree column? So we went back to the tree column, and that's where we are today. Here's a updated version of that rendering. You'll notice a few things that are different. There's planted screen that will be on either side of the side window or the side buildings in the setback. There's also a planted screen here along the rail. To, um, to provide a protective guard rail as the patio stays level and the, the <laughs> visitation slopes down the street. We've also included a new accessible parking lot right in front that on either side is um, flanked by a planted area that helps, a nav or helps uh, yeah, negotiate the slope of visitation. And the bike, the bike um, parking has been moved out to the sidewalk, so it's open for use by many. And that concludes the presentation. Thank you very much again for your time and interest, and it is truly a treat to work with you on this project. Any questions for Susie? I do. I do. Okay. Uh, the History Subcommittee met yesterday in regards to the uh, archive room and we don't want to give that up <laughs> that's okay. our recommendation absolutely not because uh, you said it at the beginning of your your presentation that people love the rich history of Brisbane yes. people here and we don't really have any place for them to research that and we have all these wonderful things artifacts and whatever to research it and so um, I think it's our recommendation is to to keep that room <coughs> and uh, we'll come up with some programming on that later on Perfect. and you know we'll certainly discuss it right. with the library I know that they don't want to necessarily own that but uh, uh, it is important I think that's why the previous council I think which four of us were on um, had said that we wanted to have that room mm -hmm. <clears throat> because I think originally with the uh, old library or the current library that we have right now it was this wonderful collection of Brisbane bees and there and now they're up upstairs right. just sitting in storage and it's not something that you know just want to turn over to anybody you know uh, we want to get that you know catalog archived you know digitized and so you need a place to kind of do these things and so you know uh, from that sense our recommendation as mm -hmm. a subcommittee is to uh, keep that mm. and it's yeah. it's in the plan right mm. But you alluded to well, there giving was it talk. up. Well, there was talk. So <laughs> okay. And my, the, point of the, the point of my point was, should it become available for other users, sure. the library would love these little studies. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, um, 
great, great plan. I, I you know, impressed with the, uh, the community group working, working with you folks, and you know, I'm kind of the backup, but I just, just stay out of, stay out of it, and see what people come up with, you know, and and uh, I'm impressed with it, you know. I'm, well, thank you. I'm, I'm excited about it. You know, I've been excited about it for for years, years to come. Uh, uh, I was hoping to get a little bit different entrance, but that's a, that's a total different story. It has nothing to do with this <laughs> project, so. All right, any other questions, uh, Clark? That's it. That's it, okay. Um, Mattis, or, yeah, Lori? Yeah, well, I'm on the subcommittee, so I've seen all these plans, but um, it's great, great to see it again. And yeah, I'm very excited um, and, and grateful for all the work that that you all have all done on this. I think you've really done an excellent job of capturing the spirit of Brisbane. I love the idea of you know bringing the outside in, um, you know, separating all the different spaces because you know the current library does have its constraints, and I, you know to to be able to have the quiet reading area. Um, separate from the children's area and the children's area spilling out into the garden, mm -hmm. uh, a place for parents to let their kids wander a little bit but not too far. Um, and then, you know, being able to use that community room space, um, breaking it up when necessary or using the whole thing. I think it, there's just so much flexibility built into this space. So I'm very excited to, to see this uh, move forward. Um, as to the archive room, um, I just, you know, I understand, I, I agree that there is, you know, a need for a place for archives. Um, as the plan has progressed, I've seen that it, the space does look rather small for, you know, what, what I had envisioned was that it would be a place with windows and, you know, room to maybe walk around a table and look at some display cases. But from what I've heard, it, it's pretty small the archive room space and it'll be more like more of a, a storage room um, and you know, my my preference would be to put those archives somewhere else where they can be accessed still within the library but to actually utilize that space um, for those two quiet study or group study rooms I think that that's a real need uh, and could be very useful as well for students tutors small community groups people who want to um, you know, have a group meeting, but don't want to necessarily meet uh, in a, such a public place like at the coffee shop, but want, you know, a place that's more contained where they can have a, a real conversation. I, I think that that space could be really useful for that. So I, I totally understand what you're saying. About they're, in, they're in the battle will lie <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> in that little room. <laughs> so, um, but something will go there <laughs> for sure. So looking forward to, to seeing it go forward and open in. 2018, I believe, right? <laughs> Fingers crossed. Terry? Um, well, I think that everybody working on the project has done a fabulous job, and uh, so far it looks great. Um, a lot of good ideas. I really think that, um, you know, talking about the history room, um, I think it's good to have those archives available in the library setting where research is done and if they're located somewhere else they're out of sight out of mind and not accessible so I agree with Clark on leaving that space in as an archive room because I think that's something that the city while budgeting for this library project is one of the considerations along with having meeting rooms and and you know breakout rooms and maker space I think that it's really important to have those archives available that's it Matt do you have any questions uh, no just comments just comments well it's brilliant great job I'm so excited to see so many of the things that we talked about incorporated here um, big thing that I know Lori and I had talked about was the living wall so excited we have to make that happen um also the nooks and crannies like some of those pictures that we pulled up when we were meeting i saw incorporated here and i think that that is just something that you don't see very often it's super unique um and that is very exciting to me 
um, the big chairs in the kids area. You might not necessarily think that you would need big chairs there, but I think that that's a huge need in our current library. We have like one right. sizable chair and um, it's really hard to sit with a child on your lap on the small wooden chairs. So um, just something that is cozy that you can sit in for a while and stack a couple books on the side is going to be fantastic and I cannot wait for that. Um, stroller parking, big need for that as well. Like you, ca- It's like you want to get to the library first so you have a place to put your stroller in our current library and then everyone who comes after you, it's like, well, I got the one spot. <laughs> so so that's great to see that. Um, and uh, in terms of the archive room, I think that uh, you know Clark and I were discussing putting a table in there so that people would venture in there and we can change out what is included in that room. We, you know, not everything is necessarily going to go in there all at once, so we can rotate that stuff in and out. Um, we talked about it being something that was open and inviting. We want people to go in there. We don't envision it being a place that's just going to end up being storage, and that's something that we're very conscious of. And we we want this a pl- to be a place that's inviting, where people want to see what's in there and travel and, and explore Brisbane's history. And we really don't have an opportunity to do that currently with the spaces that we have in our community right Right now, so I think that this is something that our community will access. Um, but we we talked about putting a table in there so that somebody might venture in there to use the table and then realize what they're surrounded with. And it's definitely something that we we don't want to shoot it down before we've even determined that it is going to be storage or a place that nobody is going to use that's just going to be dead space that's thrown away. I think that we have a passion for programming it the right way. And first, we want to see it in action and really determine, you know, is this a space that is is or is not going to be utilized and you're not really going to know unless you actually do it and you know if five years down the line we decide that that's really an, an underutilized space and at that point we can reevaluate that but I don't want to shoot it down before we've even given it a chance to have some legs so I think that that was the, the thinking that Clark and I had based on our conversation from yesterday. Um, develop a program for it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So uh, we don't have to get like too much into that now, but all in all, I think that this is a really great plan. I love how much detail you've put into it. I prefer the house made out of the, the little casita, made out of the little logs that looks like, like a little nest versus the one with the bigger logs. Okay. So <laughs> the willow versus the, the willow. The yeah, like willow. the little hut. The hut's really cute. Um, and I, I like that you you did so much research in, into the wind factor and how the trees play into that. Um, the sun, all of that's really important and not things that I would necessarily, I mean, sun is obvious, but wind to me is not something that I would necessarily mm-hmm. think of looking at. Um, so I really feel confident in, in you were the right person for the job. I'm so glad that we picked you guys. I wasn't part of that decision, but you guys did a fantastic job and I can't wait to get in there. I feel like I'm going to use this library so much more. It's so much more inviting than what we currently have, and this is going to be a blessing to our community. So thank you very much. Well, thank you. All right. Um, thank you, Susie, for the great presentation and all the hard work that you've done. Um, you know, I think yeah, a testament to a fine consultant is the consulting team listens. And, and that's what you've done. You've listened to this community, you've listened to the stakeholder group, um, and you've then applied that feedback into a brilliant design. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, I just highly just want to applaud well, what you've you. done. Um, I think when this, this library is completed in the next couple of years, uh, this community is going to be so proud mm-hmm. of, of what we've all accomplished. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, in in regards to the, you know, to the store or not the storage place, the arch- historical archive place. Or do um, you, flip? Is that, <laughs> you know, I, you know, Madison brings up a good point. You know about um, you know maybe trying it out. I mean, I've uh, you know I've done some research at other libraries, and, and you know, communities. You know, they want to showcase their history, and they want to have a place where you can go. Um, they're good ideas, but in, in reality, they, they tend to be rarely used. And the space is small. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 220 square feet is pretty tiny. Um, Counting panels. Yeah, you know, just trying to get a sense. I mean, it's probably not much bigger than this space right here that, that you're in. 
Um, 10 by 12. Yeah. Um, so, you know, in regards to where Madison was going, in regards to if the site or the place doesn't uh, get utilized in the way that we would like, I mean, how difficult is it to um, convert or, or do you design it to be multifunctional? Right. Well, the, um, I, I will say that just pointing up here, the two sidewalk right now in the structural design, this wall right here and this wall right here are both uh, shear walls. They're wood shear walls. They're bearing walls. And, and Well, they're shear, mostly. I mean, it's a one-story building, but mostly they're shear and they're tying into the diaphragm. Um, and we're trying to keep the structure inexpensive instead of introducing moment frames. We do have some metal frames that, that have to do with holding up this the, the high portion of the roof. But back here, we just had a pair of wood shear walls. So this wall here is not a bearing wall. This wall here in the front. So in the future, should it be decided that um, you want to convert this to something else, you can you can do that without. I mean, remember, we, well, more than just the archive room might change in five years in terms of what you do in a library space. So, so what about the idea of having that front wall be glass, even if it's an archive room? That's what we were because discussing. then it actually people. Or no, can. right, yeah. then it's inviting. People want to go inside because right. they see it. Or so. even having the door, you know, the doors can go to something that's more transparent anyway. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. So, Mayor, if I may, I, I think it would be relatively simple at this point, <clears throat> it, it, and, I'm, and I'm really glad that, that it sounds like the council wants to at least keep the walls. I'm not going to refer to it as the room or as its use because those shear walls really are there to resist earthquake forces and to resist wind uplift. And I'm not going to try and give you a, a structural design or a seismic engineering class tonight, because even though my license allows me to, to design a 10-story building, that's not what I specialize in, so I don't want to go down that path. But we really do need those walls. Uh, but what I think, and what I, I and I won't even ask Susie to, to, to offer too much of an opinion on it, because we've kind of discussed it offline, but we can take that wall that runs down the main spine, make that mostly glass, put two doors there, so that in the interim, while we are developing the full program to have an archival research type area, that room can be utilized as independent rooms for study, but then it'll also be open. It'll, present, it'll prevent the room from wanting to be used for something else. And, it'll eat, and then if, if at the end of the day, another council or the programming folks for the library decide that we don't want, maybe we want to retrieve those archived and research artifacts and bring them somewhere else we can, and then you've still got usable type room space that's that's visible and that maybe it becomes another quiet study area but it's still a room it's still usable it can be programmed pretty mm -hmm. well so would if we did it that way with two doors and mostly glass on the wall if in the future we wanted to divide it into two and put a, a partition is that something that we could easily do that's what you do. absolutely it wouldn't take any any type of shear or, or a bearing wall to do that so it's a partition in the um the 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 working group that's been, you know, going through the, the the design process. So they they were asked to provide their feedback. Um, so what was their feedback on in regards to that room, Andy? So on the second page of the staff report, uh, I indicated there it's about three or four paragraphs down. I, so what I did in that case was I. I surveyed the non San Mateo County Library staff, not to exclude them, but just you know to get to get the opinion of the other stakeholders on the group, and across the board, all but one voted to reprogram the area if that's the council's desire. So that the, the way the question was asked was that you know there is a conversation about whether or not this council might want to keep that or might want to change it, but then there was an explanation that the shear walls were valuable from a structural engineering perspective. So then the question was asked if it's the council's desire to take it out of the program, because I mean, that's, that's who I work for. I work for a majority of the body of five, but the previous one told us to put it in, and if this yeah, tells me to take it out, amen, we'll do it, we'll march forward. Um, but they understood that the walls are necessary, and, 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 it, and it is a significant, I mean, if you were to just say, and I know we're not having that conversation, but if you were to just say, Hey, take those walls out. They're ugly. We don't like them. We want anything there. We just want open space. You can do it. You can design a building to do that, but you're looking at a $100,000 construction change. So, and part of what I'm trying to do very vigorously as your, as your project manager is to get you the best value as quick as I can 
without adding extra cost to it. So that's why I, sometimes I'm, I'm, I'm trying to push you in the direction that I think will get you there and that will get you your library built and that, that won't add exorbitant cost to it by, as Susie mentioned, adding things like moment-resisting frames, big steel structures out at either end of the building that, that at the end of the day for the user would add nothing for you. Yeah, no, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, and when you're asking for things and then you see it, you know, then you, know, you, you, you might want to alter your perspective. And you, you're right, Clark, you know, originally we were thinking of the, of the historical archive room. Um, now when I look at the space, I see the teen area not very big. And I know that teens like to use the library and, um, you know, and so, you know, I, I look to the library staff, I look to the stakeholder group for, you know, their feedback. They, they are the ones that have been spending the time and, and have the experience and expertise mm -hmm. to know what makes a library really functional. And, you know, and having the space be uh, a place for students to be tutored or for a gathering, a small gathering of, of students to, you know, to, to work on a project together. Um, and, and not worry about, you know, disrupting somebody else. You know, they can just focus it on themselves. Well, I can come up with a quick alternative. And so, it, let me finish, please. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Clark. I mean, I, um, so, it, from what I can't Randy believe is, how political this is becoming. I know, I'm just, I'm just. <laughs> it's like, uh, the whole thing, out of the whole project, this little space is becoming you know, our, very political. You know. I'm disgusted uh, with it, be honest. I really am. Okay, uh, you're, you're. But you uh, can finish, Mr. Thank, thank you, Clark. And so. You know, Randy has, has put forth a suggestion, which I, I, I think is, is a good one, you know, where we can, as we're working out our, I guess, the archival process, you know, we could use this space, you know, temporarily as a study area and, and then also see what kind of feedback we get from that as well. You know, Clark, just because you're, you, this is something you really like, you're entitled to that. If I see something that I'd like to see different, I'm entitled to that opinion as well. Assuming. And so well, let, me, I'm, okay. let me finish. I feel like I'm entitled to, as a counsel, as one of five, who will be, uh, you know, deciding that we will move forward with this project and we will fund this project, that I should have my opinion, and that should be okay. And, I, you, know, I would, you know, I listen to what you have to say. I'm not getting angry by it. I, I listen to it and I appreciate it. I am providing my feedback just like any other council member. The question you asked Randy was to stakeholders outside, but not the stakeholders who designed it, who came up with it. If I'm, if I'm correct, you talked to library personnel, not the people who did the designing, right? Well, well so actually, sorry, I, I'm sorry if I, if I confuse things here. I, I actually talked to both people. We did ask, we did have separate conversations with the San Mateo County Library staff about, and we asked them, you know, they're, they're, they're like me. They're pretty agnostic as to whether the city right. council wants to put another couple hundred square feet into a building and, right. and program it for the city's own uses. They're like, okay, sure, that's fine. Um, but then when we look at it and that we had those same conversations about, well, what if the council decided that we wanted to take away that one program area? What would you do? Their recommendation was, well, if you're not going to have that, we would really, really like to have two separate rooms in there because we think that could be utilized. So, and, and, and I don't know, maybe I, when I framed it to the non San Mateo County Library stakeholder staff, I tried to focus it more from an engineering cost time delivery perspective of, you know, same question. If you don't want to... If you don't want to have that program there, that's fine. But understanding that it has cost and, and, and other delay issues, w would you be okay with reprogramming it? And they across the board said yes. And then in the suggestion that I made to Mayor Lentz earlier, what I was then doing was taking I, what I thought, and, I, and I'm sorry if I didn't get it right, but I thought I was taking the same sort of input that I had received from the History Committee the other night where, where I thought you and, and Council Member Davis were both suggesting that it be open and inviting. So that's why the idea of putting in you know, a mostly glass wall, not a full glass wall, but it can be, you know, right. waist high up so that you can see into it, and then a door on either end so that if we eventually want to separate it, you put a, you put an easy, non-expensive partition in, or you could just have a big room that's got a door from each side. It's, that's Sure. So, the only caveat was that, sure. that it's assumed that there wouldn't be a program in place by the time a new library is open. Mm -hmm. And that's what the assumption was. And that was... Um, Probably an incorrect assumption. It's just an assumption. 
that we wouldn't have a program in place. The same well, if we didn't have a program in place by 2018, you know, when the library opens and uh, perhaps we could use it in the interim or something else. Well, that's that's a big assumption. Uh, and or, I just, you know, the I, library, I, the library or, or the history subcommittee is going to be working on that. And that was one of our conversations last night. How do we get from here to there? And Clay was going to talk to Anne Marie, who's in the audience, and 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 her staff, and come up with some mm -hmm. ideas there. And also from a city budgetary point, we're going to look at how we can do that too. So that was a big assumption, and that's what makes me a little bit hot under the collar because it's becoming so political. This little space, just like everything else in Brisbane. And I had a suggestion. Well, why don't we just make the maker space the the archive room? That would be really nice there. So, so, you know, it's a, it's bigger it's, space. Yeah, I mean, so, we're, if we're complaining about such a small space, so, the yeah. maker space should become probably the archive room. And that is separate from the library. And so, you know, it could kind of work that way, too. So there's different alternatives that we can do. You know, you know, you know I think the design is great. And I don't want to make this a political thing. In, in regards to the the... The, you know, I, I want to get clarification. What I asked Randy, and I asked him about the Brisbane stakeholder group, and then you gave me the information about the folks that live in Brisbane provided their feedback. Am I correct? Y yes, sir. I, and okay. I tried to be clear, and I may have conflated this and confused the issue. It's so on the stakeholder group that you've got established, you do have San Mateo County Library staff people represented on it. So how many? Ask those two how many people, people from Brisbane? or on that stakeholder group? I, you, you got me, sir. I, I, I want to say seven. Okay. Councilmember Davis is, I don't know, Councilmember Lou, do you remember? <laughs> that are not the library staff. The library staff typically has two people on it. I, I could put up through my notes, but it's five to seven. It's, it's in that range. Okay, and we have the, you know, the, fo the friends of the Brisbane Library. They're, they're part yes, of Yes, sir, Fobble's Fob right. on there, correct. Okay, and, and, and what was their recommendation for the site? Reprogram. Reprogram. Okay, I'm just I'm just putting it out there, Clark. That, that I just sounded different than what you said last night, Randy, when we were in uh, the subcommittee. So, is that, so does that sound familiar to you, Madison? Just to be frank about it, 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 it sounds a little bit different here. Well, sort of the question I'm answering is yeah. how do they respond to the question I asked them? Yeah. And so the question I asked them was that if this council wants to abandon or completely change the history archive program and understanding that it would have a structural impact to take the walls out what would you do then and the choices I gave them were reprogram keep and so forth so th so that's what they responded to I, I wasn't I, I was trying to get them to answer what would happen if the council decides to remove it what would your recommendation be I, I wasn't asking them do you recommend keeping this programming because that would have been impertinent for me to ask because it was the council that told us to put that program in there but because I knew that at least two council members had addressed me outside of the meeting and intended to address it I wanted to assist you in your decision making and get the feedback from your working group yeah okay so <clears throat> having not been involved in any of this discussion because I figured there was other people who were more interested in some por por portions of the library um, it seems that what we asked the space to be included as a maker as a history space in our library when we discussed it all along and the question that was asked of staff to ask of the stakeholders was if we decided we didn't want that space what would they want to do and it was to reprogram it which of course I think is a no-brainer if we want to um, abandon the, having a historical archive. I don't think that that's what came out of your subcommittee that no. you wanted to do that. And it does seem, you know, in other respects when it's come to the community garden in town and needing to expand it and saying, well, let's put it where the li planned library is temporarily. And one of the comments I've heard is that, well, once you give away a space for something, it's really hard to take it back. Mm -hmm. And so I, 
until this council, along with staff, make a decision on what we want in that space as a council, I don't think we, we should be replanning that use, making the room, designing the room to have, to be malleable when we design the building is a great idea. But I don't think we should be putting some other use in it until we've made that decision. And I think that was a little, um, that sounded very odd to be coming saying that we're going to use it for something else until we get around to the history. So, so can, can I weigh in on this a little bit? <laughs> because, um, you know, I, I think the problem is that we haven't really defined what a history room would be. Um, yes. You know, in, in my mind, it was never a storage room. It was supposed to be an interactive um, dis mm -hmm. use of the archives that we have here that would be changing over time. But that was my perception of it. It isn't something that the council has said, yeah, this is how we want to program it. So when we met last night, the idea was that we would get together um, as the subcommittee and with staff, and um, I was going to reach out to the library folks um, and uh, talk about, okay, if we have this history room, you know, how would it operate? How would it uh, uh, be used? And I think we can come back to the council in the near future and say here's some here's some options and you know get uh, some discussion about about that because I I definitely understand what the mayor is talking about that you don't want a space that is dedicated to history but nobody really uses it um, and that's what one of the things we want to uh, want to avoid and that's I think probably what some of the concern has been so you know I think it's just a lack of definition at this point and probably everybody's got different perceptions in their head about what this room ought to be and um, and we haven't tied it down so I'd like to make maybe one su suggestion mm -hmm. um, that marketplace area seems quite large I don't know if um, if there what well, my quite my suggestion is that we also consider I mean I, th I think we all agree that we want the archives to be in the library um, but I'd like to explore whether it could be in that entrance area, like in that marketplace area, if there's enough space for it to be just displayed, not in a room, but in that open entrance, so that people would actually interact with it every time they go to the library, rather than having to go to a separate room off to the side. Um, people who are coming to our library for the first time, one of the first things they would see is the, you know, the history archive section and it could just be you know on stacks rather than in a room um, assuming I don't know what the materials are but if they're um, you know capable of being displayed in on stacks or uh, in um, cases at the entrance you know I, I what I would like to see and what I envisioned was that the archives would be more interactive um, and so that people would not just look at them if they could decide to go in that room but that's something that would be integral to the library so I think that would be worth exploring because that could be a win-win situation if we could use that space that was originally designed for archives but use it for the qu two quiet study rooms and then move the archives themselves into that front entrance way. I mean, I know when I go to libraries like Millbrae, for example, there's a huge marketplace before you get to the front, you know, the circulation desk. And I just breeze right by it um, because I'm not interested in what, you know, what necessarily are the, the new books right now like I have a specific purpose for going to the library at that time um, so you know that's something that I think can be considered because I noticed that the marketplace area is quite large yeah I, I, I think that's those are really good comments because there, there are different aspects to our history archive and some of it is kind of more display oriented some of it is more research oriented but that's the kind of a conversation we need to have about what we really want to, to have in the library. So I, I, I think it's up to the subcommittee and the staff to come back with some ideas and, and um, you know, kind of define this a little better for the council. So the history subcommittee or the library subcommittee? Well, I think we said last night that the history subcommittee would work on that. Okay. Okay, so the, the, so the history subcommittee will work on the aspects of the the kind of historical archive yeah uh, define yeah. what it is that we're finding the program yes, sir. okay and then um you know susie you, you, in your presentation you showed photos um historical photos i mean that all along you were planning to showcase the history of, of brisbane 
throughout the library, not just in this room, but throughout the library. And that, you know, we could have a program where we rotate the photos, the signs, the whatever things that represent Brisbane on a quarterly basis or, you know, whatever we decide to do. I mean, there's lots of opportunities to, to showcase the history, not just have a room for doing research. Right, and, that's, and that, I think that's where you, what you want to see, Clark, is, is a room to do research. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, well, it's, it's mul multiple, multiple functions, Cliff, because some of the stuff, uh, um, you know, I know that uh, county library staff wouldn't want to be responsible for, you know, and how, how that functions. So that's, that's the programming that we got to talk about because some of these things that would be displayed are actually artifacts and you don't want them, you know, loose anywhere. You know what I mean? They'd have to be in a display case or something. I mean, you don't want them growing legs, basically, and and leaving the library. And 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 also the research. You know, uh, maybe a program that the school comes up with. You know, uh, hey, research uh, before Brisbane Incorporated or the '60s when Brisbane was incorporating. You know, I mean, all our history books right now are just most mostly, uh, with the exception of the one that's more pictorial, uh, is written from a political sense. You know, born of fire. You know the you know the political Brisbane wrapped around that. You know, and then the two history books of Brisbane, and then you know the, you got the one that was pre-Brisbane. But you you got a lot of stuff that was you know the, the active little town that had nothing to do with politics at all. And so you know that's the that's where the rich history that you know people could research and and find these things. You know, and and, yeah. and especially kids. The next generation is just like. Hey, what, what's our what's our city about? You know, I mean, I know larger cities have you know historical societies and they have these great uh, separate places from a library, but we're a small city. We're with maybe forty seven hundred people. You know, I mean, and and we're growing almost three si three times the size of our current library, and it, it's really time for us to have something for our archives to be shown right now everything's locked up in a room and, and you, most of the people don't know the combination can't even get up there and then you got to have a key so it's it's locked up yeah. and you know people don't know at all i want to add to that too so there's a difference between discovering through photos and discovering through reading and because we are such a small city and I think a lot of our history has been oral history that we have in only a few documents you know it's not like you can just go online and find out everything you want to know about Brisbane I think a lot of the resources we have are physical resources here and you know if there was a project that say Lipman or BES wanted their um, students to work on gonna have to do that old-fashioned research in a library with a book where they do the citation and they open the page up and like I think that we want to inspire you know things are more digital but like those are certain skills that you learn also that are very important understanding how to cite research and look through it and find something in a book and really have your hands on it and so it's not just about the artifacts or displaying the photos. It's about making that available for people to really get their hands on. And I think one of the, and none of us are going to dispute this, but one of the biggest things that Siegel and Strain have um, communicated was how important Brisbane's history is to us and who we are and where we come from. And I think our community will be embracing of this because even more so than anywhere else because we have so much pride in where we came from you know I want to take my kids in that room one day and I want them to learn about Brisbane and I want them to have a physical book and I want them to be surrounded and and understand who we are because there is a culture in Brisbane that you're never going to find anywhere else and that is really important that's something that I think we're trying to preserve for generations we don't want to lose that and that's why so many things end up being controversial here is because we want to hold on to what makes us so special and communicate that to the next generation and so we want you to trust us and allow us to do an amazing job because we will and just give us the chance to do something great and you know what? If it fails, it fails. And I know Clark and I are very good at admitting when we are wrong about something and can say, hey, you know what we tried? We were wrong. 
and now let's as a team reprogram this to something else but we just want you to give us a shot to do that you know everything that you said I completely support okay absolutely what I I'd ask of you as the, the the history subcommittee is to work with the 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 consultant work with the library staff and think of ways to utilize this space in the most efficient way possible we want that you know is there a way to get what you want you know having that that hard copy historical references without having a room for it is there other ways to display you know so I just want you to, to be thinking of that space I uh, think, you know, and, and so, you know, you, you know, I think then we are, you know, trying to work together to, to utilize that space. And the reason that I'm, I'm putting it that way is that because we, we have the stakeholder group, you know, from town that has been working on this for months, and this is, they've made the recommendation that the site be used for a different purpose. And so... Is there a way to then balance those things? Okay, and if I'm, not, then okay, then you know. I'm going to put it this way: the two people on that history su subcommittee were born and raised here, her and me. And the only two people who've ever served on the city council were born and raised here, her and me. And there's a, a real deep-rooted passion there, and that's why I said, you know, if we. I know. I I'm just saying, is there, become, is, yeah. is there a way to, <laughs> and, to achieve and that? We, we right? talked about that last night. On what we're going to do, so we don't yeah. have a plan. I mean, this is this is the okay. beginning. Uh, yeah. we, we want know. a table. We want people to come in. The library and spend doesn't time there. know how to program it yet. I, I mean, you know, it's you know like, what? It, this yeah. is all new. So, Absolutely, you know, and as a council come up, right, I should be able to give my feedback, right? Yeah, yeah. And so that's what I'm doing, and, and now the subcommittee will go. No, no. I mean, I, I, we're taking right. that's that's what we did, did discuss, Cliff. So I mean, we discussed it. You know, how we're going to go about this, and so. so Okay. It's a work in progress. So, so to, to get away from from the history, alleged history room, um, <laughs> and to a different comment that I heard um, Council Member Lou talk about was that, you know, the marketplace, which is where there's a seating area and and actually book racks that have new books and mm -hmm. things that may interest people and get their attention. I love that. I hate going into a library and having nothing but computers. I like the books. I want to touch the book, pick it up, rifle through it, read a page and say, oh yeah, this is something I can read or something that I don't want to read. And so I think having actual books in a library and I mean, computers are great and all the different experiences are great and having a meeting room are great and having play areas is great, but you, you need a space for real books. And I think that they're important to have in that space. Oh yeah, I'm not suggesting eliminating it. I'm just wondering whether we need that much of it. I like the layout, personally, the way that it is. And then, you know, it's just the, the archive room, and, um, but you're gonna work on it. And it's gonna be great. So I think, I think we've, We've I'm telling you, it's going to be great. Uh, enough about it. I think we're ready to just move on with the rest of the agenda. Is that okay with the rest of the council? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. for coming out. Okay. Oh. Can you come up to the mic? Actually, first I just want to say a wonderful presentation. The only question I have is the trees. When you mentioned genku trees, are they going to be fruit barren genku trees? Fruit barren. Fruit barren. No. Thank you. I just want to make that clear because I have two of them in front of my business in the city. They are nasty. They're beautiful, but when they drop their fruit, okay. especially this time of year. Deciduous. Thank you. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah, that was a good point. Okay, so now we're going to uh, move item number B under uh, Mayor and Council Matters, which is discussion on whether to create an ad hoc committee concerning letter to FAA regarding next-gen procedures. 
Um, and, 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 you know, it says, you know, ad hoc committee concerning letter to FA, but I, I thought that we were, like, who's going to? We can take a five-minute break. All right, you know, yeah, let's, why don't we take a five-minute break? Let's take a five-minute break. Okay, fine. 